According to the GCSE spec, we have got to identify and describe differences in development between LEDCs and MEDCs, and we've got to use this, uh, do this using economic and social indicators of development. In addition, we've got to take a look at places for illustration purposes. And the second point is we've got to assess the effectiveness of social and economic indicators. So that's quite a lot to do, so we're going to do all of that in here. We're going to take a look at the differences across the globe. We're going to look at a range of economic and social indicators, and we're going to consider the pros and cons of each one. And we're going to get a chance to refer to some places on the way through. So we'll meet all the success criteria for the spec. So here we go. The first thing is to take a look at this cartoon, and in this cartoon we have two different elements. We've got the element up here at the top, which is taking a look at uh, what's meant to represent the MEDCs, and some of the um, symbolism in this shows that they're powerful, they're kind of exploiting the earth, they're getting all of the resources and they're polluting it uh, in the process. And at the bottom end you've got the LEDCs down here which are very, very poor and weak and vulnerable, and they just get whatever is left over. Now, the question is, to what extent does that actually represent the world? Well, are there very, very rich countries? Yes. Are there very, very poor countries? Yes. But what this misses is this full range in between. So we want to pick up the pattern of economic development and social development across the world using these measures of development. So the first that we'll look at will be some of the economic measures of development. Now it'll be very handy for you to have your notes beside you as I'm going through this because I'm going to be referring to things in there. So why don't you pause the video now and make sure you've got those sitting beside you. So the first one we'll look at is something called GNI per capita. Uh, first of all we need to understand what this is. GNI stands for Gross National Income. It's the total value of all goods and services produced in a country in a year, including income from foreign investment. So it's an in a measure of how much money is earned in a country. Per capita means per person. So you take the total amount of money earned, you divide it by the total number of people, and that gives you a rough indication of the average income. So some of the benefits of using the GNI per capita, it gives a very, very good approximate indication of wealth distribution across the world between different countries. It's relatively easy to produce, it's relatively easy to understand, and it is still to this day one of the most widely used measures of economic development. In addition, you can introduce this element here, PPP stands for Purchasing power parity and what it can do is kind of make up for the fact that the same product can cost different things or different prices in different countries. Um, in richer countries a product may be more expensive, in poorer countries the same product, exactly the same product may be cheaper. So your money can go a little bit further in that kind of context. So the, the overall GNI per capita can be adjusted to give um, a sense of the purchasing power parity and making it again a very useful measure of development. There are some weaknesses with it, however. First of all, that because it's an average, it gives no indication of the spread of wealth. So a country, for example, in a rich oil-producing country like Saudi Arabia can have a relatively high GNP or GNI per capita, but the wealth is concentrated in the hands of a small proportion of the people. Also, it doesn't represent um, some of the informal sector of the economy. Uh, so within LEDCs, uh, some crops can be grown as subsistence crops. In other, in other words, they're just grown for the people that actually are growing them to be sold directly in market to, to make some money to look after their family. These are not included in the value of the GNI, so it can kind of underestimate some of the economic activity in cases like that. So those are the pros and cons of using the GNI per capita. Um, what about the patterns? Well, first of all, we'll divide the world here roughly into MEDCs and LEDCs. And we can compare and contrast. Here are your values, your GN, uh, GDP, it's, which is a similar measure to GNI. Uh, per capita purchasing power parity. The bluer colours are the countries that have a higher average wealth. Now, first of all, you can see that the MEDCs up here are mostly made up of the bluer colours. And the LEDCs are mostly made up of these warmer colours, which represents lower values. However, whenever we come into the continents of the LEDCs, we can see a little bit of a difference here. Um, and I think you can see in South America over here, 
uh, it has a number of blue values and the uh, warmer colours tend to be of the higher values. And if we come over here to Asia, Asia has um, some of these higher value warmer colours. But then whenever we come into Africa, especially this little section here, which we call Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see that, that this is made up mostly of these lower values. So what it tells us is that there are differences in development, not only between MEDCs and LEDCs, but also between the continents within the LEDCs. South America being the most economically developed, Asia following in behind, and Sub-Saharan Africa especially being the poorest. Now that's the overall pattern. What you're going to see is that repeated as we look at each of these maps to give you an indication of the spread of wealth across the globe. So if you remember, according to the spec, we had to identify and describe differences in development between LEDCs and MEDCs with reference to places. We've just done that. And we need to be using social and economic indicators and assessing their effectiveness. Well, we've just started with our first one, the GNI per capita, and we've assessed that. So that's the model we're going to use as we move through the rest of them, uh, looking at the, re the remainder of the indicators. So the second economic measure we'll look at is the percentage employed in agriculture. So again, have your notes in front of you while I explain a little bit of the background context in this. Basically, the view is this in terms of people employed in these different sectors is countries are less developed. So, for example, Britain in the past, most people would have been involved in primary economic activities. Those are uh, things like farming, fishing, forestry. People would have grown their own crops. As a country becomes more developed, the first thing that happens is that people move out of the primary sector into what's called the secondary sector. Now, that's made up of manufacturing industries. So that was the Industrial Revolution in Britain, where people left the countryside, moved into the cities, and started to expand our manufacturing sector. But thirdly, um, the next stage is to move out of secondary into what are called tertiary, which are services. Uh, as a country becomes even more developed, then most people will be involved in services. That covers a really wide range of things, like you know, from relatively low skilled, like a shop assistant, to very, very high skilled and as like a brain surgeon. Most people in LE, MEDCs today are employed in the service sector. So overall this measure is a very useful way of seeing what the economic activity is like in a country and you can make some assumptions about how developed it is. In terms of the weakness of it, the main problem is related to the service sector. Uh, because it covers a, such a wide range of different job types, so, for example, on one hand, you could have what's called the informal sector in the LEDCs, where these are people who can't get a proper job, or, or formal job, I should say. Um, they can't get a formal job, so they go out into the streets and maybe sell peanuts or sell uh, whatever they can get their hands on uh, in order to work very, very hard to make a living. Uh, so that is a service sector job. Um, but if you go to the other end of the, the scale, you've got brain surgeons, uh, also service sector job. Now, the difference between the skills, the difference between the education, needed, the difference between the salaries earned in those two are obviously vast uh, and yet they're part of the same category. Now what about the patterns between MEDCs and LEDCs? Again we'll draw in the line dividing them and you can see in this map it's the percentage employed in agriculture. Now more developed countries will have fewer people employed in agriculture, less developed countries will have more people employed in agriculture. Uh, so if you have a look at the colours here uh, for MEDCs, they take you down to the lowest category here. So there's most people are employed in either manufacturing or, or tertiary activities here. We come into the different continents of the LEDCs. Again, we're going to see differences that exist between them. South America here is made up mostly of the lighter um, colours, which are the lower values. Then you've got Asia which kind of comes in a lot around this value here. And Africa, again, and especially this bit here, Sub-Saharan Africa, is of these two higher categories. So if we're going to rank these uh, three continents in order, again, South America is most developed, then Asia, then Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, least developed. And that pattern is emerging yet again. 
Economic development is only one way that you can measure development, however, because uh, as well as generating money within a country, uh, a country can be said to be developed if that money benefits the lives of people. In other words, if you can get some social development taking place as well. So we're going to move on now to take a look at a range of social developments. And the first ones are going to be related to the topic of population indicators. And here's the first of our population indicators in terms of life expectancy. Uh, it's the average lifespan of someone that is born in that country in a particular year. So let's take a look at the pattern again. We're marking on MEDCs and LEDCs. And again, you can see that the greens um, here uh, with the longer life expectancies dominate in the MEDCs. Then as you move into the continents of the LEDCs, here is South America. South America is green and yellows, so that is a longer life expectancy. Then you've got... Asia. Asia's got more of a spread. Some greens uh, and some of the oranges here, which is uh, down to the lower life expectancy. And then into Africa and especially sub-Saharan Africa, you're into the, um, the reds, the shades of red there, which are much, much lower life expectancies. So if we put these in rank order, South America is coming in number one, Asia number two, and Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa, number three. Next social measure is birth rates. Uh, birth rates, the number of births per thousand of the population per year. As you know from what we covered in population in DTM, um, lower uh, or higher birth rates imply a less developed country. Lower birth rates will have uh, occur in more developed countries. So let's mark on our MEDC LEDC boundary again, and we can see that the births per thousand, the blues, dominate MEDCs. And when you get into LEDCs. Uh, let's start in sub-Saharan Africa this time because it's very clearly the ones with the higher birth rate. Then whenever you get into South America and Asia, you can see it's a little bit uh, more similar than in some of the others. And in fact, you've got this large blue area here. This is China, of course, with its one child per family population policy. So it's no surprise that it's lower birth rates. Uh, so a bit of a less of a difference there, but certainly in third place, you have Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, and maybe equal first, you have Asia and South America. But you're seeing that overall pattern still there. Death rate is the deaths per thousand uh, of the population per year. Uh, let's take a look at the pattern again in this one. Uh, again, as we're looking here, I think it's clearest at the bottom. You've got Sub-Saharan Africa with all of the highest values of death rate per thousand. Then you have got South America and Asia, reasonably similar, perhaps some of the countries in Asia having a slightly higher value, so probably just about first, just about second, but clearly third down there with that pattern still very, very clear. And the next social measure of population is the infant mortality rate, the number of children who died before their birth, or the first birthday per thousand. Now it's a tragic figure in and of itself, of course, but the infant mortality rate is a very, very sensitive measure of development because uh, what you can draw from that, the conclusions you can draw from that uh, go way beyond the, um, just the, the actual figure itself. What is it that causes young children to die? It's bad medical care, it's lack of basic um, medical care whenever they're young, the uh, immunisation programmes and things they'll need, uh, lack of um, good sanitation uh, where they're very, very vulnerable to diseases that adults can shrug off and poor nutrition, those fa uh, fa uh, factors of MSN, medical care, sanitation and nutrition. Um, and if we have a look at this pattern here, Uh, what we can see here, again, the greens tend to dominate in the MEDCs. We tend to have lower infant mortality rates. Then if you have a look at sub-Saharan Africa here with the highest values, definitely coming in worst. South America with fewer blues than Asia probably coming in first, so that pattern still remains. Talking of nutrition and health, that brings us on to the second category of um, social measures, nutrition and health measures. The percentage of population that is undernourished is shown on this map. Here's our dividing line. And again, the smaller values tend to dominate in the MEDCs. Sub-Saharan Africa tends to have some of these higher values here. And Latin America has some yellows and greens, bringing us in around about here. 
and um, Asia uh, has some yellows and oranges just bring this in around about here so again we've got the one two three of these different continents so some measures of percentage of the country's budget that's spent on health care how good is access to Doctors, let's put this line in here for MEDCs and LEDCs. The keys may be a little bit harder to read here, but you're seeing in many ways a similar pattern here. Uh, certainly in first position, you've got uh, Latin America, South America. Then you have um, Africa and some parts of Asia with not quite such good uh, figures as well. So maybe joint second here in these cases. But the overall pattern is, is not too dissimilar to what we've seen before. And the final social measure that we're looking at here is the social measure of population literacy rates. Then here comes our line in. And with the blues being the highest values, making up most of the MEDCs. Then you've got Africa here with the oranges and reds, so their values are lower. Um, South America, blues and green, so up towards the top here. And you've got Asia coming in with a slightly bigger range. So our order would be number one for South America, number two for Asia, and number three for Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, in terms of the population that can read and write. So a quick review. What we've discovered through this video is to be able to identify and describe differences in development between MEDCs and LEDCs. We can see across a range of social and economic indicators, MEDCs are definitely better off than LEDCs. There certainly are some very rich countries, and in Sub-Saharan Africa especially, there are certainly some very, very poor countries. However, within that we've seen that there is this variation that we would put, generally speaking, South America um, would be the most developed of the LEDC continents. Then you're going to have Asia, and down at the bottom you've got Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. And we've been able to describe that pattern with reference to some of those places. We've done that through a range of social and economic indicators and for some of them we've been able to look at uh, assessing the effectiveness of those individual measures. Now I'm going to do another video which is going to pick up on this one and it's going to take that last point forward about the effectiveness of social and economic measures. And just to set that up, it's just to remind you again that development is a broad concept. As you can see through these variety of different measures, it's a very, very broad concept and arguably only having one factor to, to, to summarise such a broad range of concepts isn't going to represent development properly. And that's what's prompted us to think actually we don't need to have, or we need to have more than just some economic and some social measures. We need to have one, uh, a measure that combines them together into a composite measure uh, because the breadth of that measure better reflects the breadth of, of this whole concept of development. That's when the next video is going to go and it's going to help us just to assess the effectiveness of social and economic indicators.